You're listening to Comic Reflections, episode 70. I'm your host, Nicholas Prom. And I'm Jeff Barnhart. <laughs> Racially insensitive sidekick. <laughs> Is he ever? <laughs> no. Like, um, oh. Like Pie uh, Face Pies. or uh, uh, Ebony, Ebony White. White. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there are a few of them. Oh, and, and, and Wing, uh, the sidekick of the Crimson Avenger. Oh, remember him yeah i think we only saw him maybe once or twice mm. yeah totally asian stereotype he even had a yellow costume oh man <laughs> i thought yellow meant was royalty no it was a royal color well here it, it's like yellow yeah. like chinaman right. cowardly mm -hmm. you know yeah, like all yellow kinds of menace and all that stuff. yeah yeah mm -hmm. all kinds of bad stuff so but uh, comic reflections is a proud member of the rhymes with geek podcast network you can listen to our show and lots of other cool podcasts like Feed It Comics, Super Podcast of Magnifico, Real Books Don't Have Batman, and loads of others at rhymeswithgeek.com. So where we want to start off today with some Fantastic Four. Yep, and it's always fantastic. All right. It's always pleasing. And yeah. the, the plots are never quite sure where they're going to, which I like. Yeah, it's unexpected things around every corner. I mean, that's Jack Kirby for you. Mm -hmm. But um, something very special about the Fantastic Four. I don't know. I just, yeah. you know, it's, I don't know. It is weird. Yeah. I, I, the arguments get old. And I'm going to leave the Fantastic Four because I'm ugly. Or blah, 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 <laughs> and, uh, man, it, it's... Yeah, it seems so, like Ben is ready to leave the Fantastic Four at a moment's oh, notice. Oh, and Johnny, too. And, sure. Uh, and... Some silly arguments, and I thought they got to write about something. And yet, it's it's arguments is a Fantastic Four's Aunt May, <laughs> you know, a <laughs> okay. trope that is used too much. Okay, but but if they were like the Get Along Gang, like the Silver Age Justice League, it might get kind of stupid, yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm, oh, it, it's it, it's not bad. It's just overused. Okay, so I can dig it. But, uh, yeah, in the, Marvel had loads and loads of reprint books in the Silver and Bronze Age. And this is another one of them. It's Marvel's... Oh, wonderful. Oh, okay. yeah. I, I love that they had all these series that they would just reprint their books mm -hmm. that were a few years old. And, and, you know, people who were new could get kind of up to speed and right. you know, follow uh, old stuff alongside new things mm -hmm. coming out, which is a brilliant business strategy. It also choked out a lot of competitors in the, in the 70s. Mm -hmm. um, gave DC a lot of problems and... Um, uh, upstarts businesses like uh, uh, Atlas Comics, not the 50s Marvel Atlas, but mm -hmm. a different Atlas, um, uh, came and were, came and went within like a year and a half. And uh, yeah, yeah, Marvel dominated the, the market in the, in the 1970s, mm -hmm. um, which was interesting because the, the previous decade they were the young upstarts. Right. And they were actually, until 1968, had a their distribution was through DC Comics. Yeah. And they could only put out about uh, eight books a month. And so everything was... Wow. Most everything was uh, bi-monthly. And um, that's why you saw books that were like co-headliners, like Tales, from T uh, Tales to Astonish, Tales of Suspense, mm -hmm. um, where you had two lead characters. You know, um, mm -hmm. it was because they couldn't afford to give everybody their own book. Yeah. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, that changed. They, that deal, uh, they were no longer bound by that by, in 68. And, boy, they went gangbusters after that. Yeah, and, and it's, maybe that, uh, that horror should have made them better. I think, you're, I think absolutely that. Not only were they doing, like, okay, what can we do that's not copying DC Comics, mm -hmm. um, but also, you know, and so we don't get, you know, ruffle their feathers, um, but also create, you know, exciting comic books. And they hit on a, oddly enough, winning formula by breaking from the established formula of um, the previous uh, industry giant. Right. So, hmm. but it was cool because you got to have these two wonderful and very different companies uh, side by side and producing a lot of great material. Okay, let's so. start off with our first one. The gentleman's name is Gorgon. Yes, and this is in Marvel's Greatest Comics, number 33, uh, reprinting 
uh, Fantastic Four, number 44, and number 45. But yes, the gentleman's name is Gorgon. Mm-hmm. Written by Stan Lee, with art by Jack Kirby, and ink by Joe Sinnott. Yeah, it's a pretty cool story. They've been just got married, uh, Reed okay. and Sue, and all of a sudden, Gorgon comes up. And Ollie, his superpower is stomping. Yeah. <laughs> It's a heck of a stomp. Yeah. So Medusa, who was, I was under, I was miscorrect, I was uh, incorrect. I'd been saying that she was an amnesiac and that's why mm-hmm. she was with the Frightful Four. That's not the case at all. She had just wanted to get away from the other Inhumans. Mm-hmm. And so she left the Great Refuge. And so now Gorgon is coming back to find her and bring her back. She doesn't want to go. And uh, so she comes to the Fantastic Four for help. Johnny specifically, mm-hmm. and then Gorgon's in pursuit, and he's fought in Fantastic Four, and they also run into an old adversary of theirs, uh, the Dragon Man, who was an android. Yeah, he was a big baby who's super powerful. That's yeah, an interesting character. Cool thing about mm-hmm. Dragon Man is he was an android that the scientists couldn't quite get to work right, mm-hmm. and then Diablo used some magic to kind of fill in the gaps, and so he's. Uh, uh, he's kind of Dragon Man's kind of like a homunculus. Remember that from like old? Yeah, stories? I forgot what the devil that is, but I can, yeah, yeah, but I've heard it's it. like an artificial magical mm-hmm. being. But but, but uh, there are some really cool fights. Yeah, and then here comes more Inhumans, right? Yeah, and they're trying to get Medusa back, and they're running away from what's his guy's name? The Seeker. The Seeker. He's a big jerk. But, yeah. um, and yes, but then he turns out later on the issues be okay. Yeah. But, man. I, as, we were, as I was reading this, I was like, man, really hoping that Ben was just going to clobber Gorgon because he's such a jerk. Mm-hmm. Uh, and he just, I just wanted to really see uh, uh, Ben let him have it. Yeah. He's kind of got cloven hooves, looks like. Yeah. Hmm. Um, but it turns out, yeah. You know, that to be misunderstood. So. Yeah, as is a constant trope of Marvel Comics. Mm-hmm. But um, yeah, man, Dragon Man looks so cool. Oh yeah, I, I enjoy him as a. It's mm-hmm. hard to call him a character, I don't know. but I guess he is. I mean, yeah, I mean he's a cool monster, cool uh, uh, thing. You know, uh, I don't mm-hmm. know. Um, so it, when Marvel would do these reprint books, sometimes they, they do a double feed, you know, mm-hmm. reprint a couple of issues in succession. But this, they, uh, they stick smack in the middle um, a, a Thing and Human Torch uh, solo adventure uh, from Strange Tales, number 130. It's Meet the Beatles, written by Stan Lee, with art by Bob Powell and Chick Stone. And, yes, it's Ben and Johnny, uh, Meet the Beatles, kind of. Yeah, uh... Well, the girls want to go see the Beatles, and so it's and Dory the, and uh, Alicia, right? Right. The girlfriends of and they right. see them about two or three times. <laughs> so yeah, at least twice, maybe three times. Yeah. And <laughs> Alicia, of course, cannot see them because she's blind. Right. So Ben and Johnny are going to take Alicia and Dory to see the Beatles, and when they go to the show, uh, somebody's uh, ripped off the box office, and so yeah, that's that's such a yeah. Uh, someone stole the payroll. Well, let's go get them. Or something. Yeah. You know, it's really, but um, I, I never. It doesn't happen anymore because no one has payroll. So that's a sure a thing of the past. It's an anachronism, or it would be if it was in a current story. But yeah. Um. Oh, well, nice little story. Uh, the the thieves wear beetle Be- beetle, <laughs> beetle wigs. <laughs> Why? <laughs> so, so, well, uh, of course, well, I can... guess a lot of people are wearing this for gags. So. Oh yeah, I mean, beetle mania, like. A lot of people had beetle wigs. Yeah, that was a decent movie, Beetle Mania. Have you ever seen it? No, it's, it's, I, it's, it's kind documentary. of nice and sweet. So, yeah. I remember uh, Hard Day's Night, which is one of my favorite movies ever. Yeah, it's great. Yeah, it's a goodie. Yeah, it's just really well done. I even wore my Beatles T-shirt today. I wasn't even put it on because we were going to talk about them in this comic today. Mm-hmm. I just threw this on. Yeah. So, but it's, it's a nice little story, and it's not nothing. <laughs> but, yeah. The thing puts on a beetle, beetle wig, <laughs> beetle wig, and it looks. 
Yeah. Pretty cool. So the, now, the girls get to see him, but Johnny and Thing don't. So. They miss the show, yeah. Wah, 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 but wah. Um, <laughs> Ben and Johnny do catch up with these thieves in an amusement park, and mm-hmm. it's so like Saturday morning cartoon, this this story. Yeah. Bob Howell's art especially gives it that feel, and the plot's kind of dumb. Right. But it's almost, hey, do something to the Beatles. Okay. You know, well, you sure, and you know it probably sold a bunch, you know, they probably sold a boatload of copies because... It's, you know, that was the thing. They were the hot ticket. Yeah. So, so you know, I just want to say, you probably have been sick of the Beatles if you were around in 1964. So, hmm, would I have been? I don't know. You know, because you heard them all the time. And that's that's why I hated disco in the 70s. Because it was oh, so pervasive. Oh, you couldn't escape it. Yeah. But, but um... And this is one group. I mean, disco had dozens and well, hundreds of well, groups. Well, I mean, they led, the Beatles led the British invasion. Mm-hmm. But I think, I don't know. I, I don't know if I would have gotten sick of them because, A, they, you get sick of something if it's the same old thing over and over. But they were coming out with a lot of new material in a short amount of time, too. Yeah. You Unlike know? today, 10 years between albums and such. Well, yeah, people seem- have album, It's people have years between albums these days. And, you know, yeah. th- there was a time that you had albums, you know, every three to six months, a new album from somebody that you like. Yeah. And music wasn't so pervasive. You didn't go, you didn't walk into the supermarket and hear the Beatles like you would right. now. You had to hope it was playing on your radio station mm-hmm. or you had to buy those records. Mm-hmm. You know, it's it's very more private consumption. Right. Um, and uh, I don't know. That's all they have is records, right? Eight tracks weren't invented. Um, uh, Real to Real was probably around. Yeah, but I but bet that the didn't Beatles last. were probably, Yeah, and well, Real to Real was around for a long time, but I was just for super. Um, yeah. Um, it's such people. an impractical format to have. Yeah, but it was serious music listeners, mostly classic and jazz, I'm sure. sure. I'm sure the Beatles were on it, but. It's beyond your look, your average teenager's chance or right. um, pocketbook to buy one. Right, and it's before cassettes or even a track. So yeah, mm-hmm. vinyl would have been the thing. So, but yeah, eh, it's an okay story. Okay. Well, but moving on to okay. the, the the main event here, yeah. gang. Among us, hide the Inhumans. Yes, from Fantastic Four number forty five, uh, written by Stan Lee with art by Jack Kirby and Joe Sinnott. Yeah, it's. The Dragon Man, for some reason, has turned from uh, purpley gray to green. Oh, he has. What the devil? <laughs> <laughs> it's probably a printing mistake or a colorist mistake. Yeah. Um, we see that the uh, Sandman and Tree Spot Pete. Yeah. Uh, the trick was Trapster. Yeah. He tried, and they got him in jail. They're in jail. Yeah. And so he's gonna bust his way. Sam is gonna bust his way through the window, and he smashes it, and it's electrified. And another glass falls down. So, and, yeah. And it's kind of a cool. I love taking the time to say like, hmm, we have to devise super prison cells to 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 contain super villainy. You know, super powered individuals. Be, yeah. yeah I yeah. mean, if that, I mean, you yeah, would have to do that if 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 people had superpowers in real life. You would have to create ways to imprison super criminals, you know, specific to their power oh, you set. you have to kill them. Yeah. Yeah, and then what else can you do? So. Yeah, and well, and in a world with if people really had superpowers, superpowered people and regular folks would be dying all the time. Right. I've said it before, like, in a world with where people have superpowers, every day would be 9-11. <sighs> Probably. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, maybe not that bad, but it'd be serious disaster. Somebody would pull in front of the, the thing, and and thing would get mad and throw some cars around, and yeah. 30, 50 people get killed. Well, you have to think like how many manslaughter charges, how many uh, you know property damage suits yeah. would be going mm-hmm. on. I mean, yeah, you know, superheroes would even have to would have to maintain a level of anonymity because most of them probably wouldn't be able to pay for that kind of stuff. Right. Um, you know, Spider Man couldn't afford you know, that kind of insurance. Well, yeah, that's. Not with Aunt May and all that well, stuff. right. I mean, not everyone is a Bruce Wayne or a Tony Stark when they could just say, ah, yeah, mm-hmm. you just throw money at a problem. Right. That's that's the story of The Incredibles, so. Oh, yeah. It's been a while since I've seen that. Yeah, but he injured somebody who was trying to commit suicide, Mr. Incredible, and yeah. he sued, and then 
the government got tired of paying for the insurance, so they they suppressed yeah. them. Hmm. Well, sure, yeah. and it's kind of like in Watchmen. You know, they have the Keen Act that the Keen Act mm -hmm. that puts superheroes out to grass, and uh, and in DC Comics, I think there was. Uh, they had a story where it was uh, the McCarthy hearings kind of forced the original Justice Society to retire. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I don't know. So yeah. what's going on in this story? Are the Frightful Four uh, getting tangled up in this? Yeah. Uh... Or was it what's just that on? scene with the the trapster and no, they're Sammy? not involved. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Um, thank goodness, it's already complicated enough. <laughs> So what uh, the Fantastic Four are they... Yeah, they, they? They get Dragon Man, bring him back, and Johnny takes a um, wants to get a date, and so. Oh, that's she, right, because he meets Crystal of the Inhumans. Well, Dory he calls Dory, and she's got another date. Yeah. <laughs> and let's see. Uh, he's he's really mad. She can't make it. A chance to go out with me, and she takes another date. I always thought there was some very strange about that chick. Man. <laughs> I the, laughed out loud. Well, sure. And the ego on this kid. You know? Oh, he's a superhero. You yeah. Know? I, it'd be almost impossible not to get an ego about it. Yeah. I guess so. So, yeah. He, he meets Crystal and falls in love. Yeah. And Crystal is one of the Inhumans, of course. And mm -hmm. she's got elemental powers. Yep. If you recall, years later, Crystal would marry Quicksilver. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, all right, we meet Lockjaw, Yay. who Jeff loves. Lockjaw, the the great big dog that teleports anywhere, any which way you can. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you know he's like a dog version of the thing. Ugly but lovable. Sure. It's um pretty cool. Oh, thing fights Dragon Man. Oh. Thing is, just tries to barrel through, and he and he knocks Dragon Man. And they get in the fight. And, you know, the thing was a little bit more nice. <laughs> he wouldn't have gotten this huge fight. Ned. Right. So they knock Dragon Man out, and they meet. Let's see. Karnak. Karnak. Not we, the great Karnak with a turban, but. Uh... <laughs> when is where he got his name? Or. Oh, it's an old term. I can't remember what it's from. Mm -hmm. I think it has something to do with... Karnak was... Um, wasn't that Alexander... It has something to do with Alexander the Great. Really? I thought. Yeah. Well, you might be right. Um, but Karnak can determine the weakness of any object and destroy it. Yeah. Because he's got this like kind of super kung fu fists. Mm -hmm. um, and so... Yeah. yeah, and we meet in the other in humans. We meet uh, Triton... Mm -hmm. And uh, oh, who else? Um, More to come, I guess. Yeah. Ree brings out his air car, uh, air jet, which is cool as all get out. Oh yeah, I love this thing, and that's such a great big splash page. Mm -hmm. That's uh, gorgeous. And so, and we finally see Black Bolt. Yeah, Black Bolt, who is a leader of the Inhumans, and uh, so the Inhumans, uh, they're lying in wait. For the Fantastic Four, and mm -hmm. they do get the drop on them. Yep, they yeah. do. Now oh, it's a huge battle, which is next. Yeah, I know. I love it. Luckily, we've got the next issue of Marvel, Marvel's Greatest Comics, uh, which is number 34. And uh, the lead story reprints uh, Fantastic Four number 46, Those Who Would Destroy Us, written by Stan Lee, with art again by Jack King Kirby and Joe Sinnott, inking. Okay. Um. Oh. Those are. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, the title on the on the cover would be "Where the Hidden Land," which is the lead, which is the title of the yeah. next issue and story in this. But. Right. Okay. So, um, pretty. Yeah, no, that's what confused me. I was like, I don't see that. Oh yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah. Listeners in podcast land. You're like, what the heck is he talking about? <laughs> okay. So. <clears throat> is this the very next one? Because it seems like they've already started fighting. <laughs> yeah, well, they did. It is the very next one. Yeah, and it's a huge battle. Black Bolt's pretty strong. This yeah. thing has, I don't know, it's run for the money. Yeah, and uh, Ben's kind of uh, unnerved because Black Bolt has the kind of the silent but deadly treatment 
throughout uh, fights. Yeah. Mostly the villains are very talkative and, and they do monologues all the time. Yeah. Um, and it's so funny, like, you'll see, like, between blows, like, trading witticisms or, you know, mm -hmm. whatever. But uh, Black Bolt can't speak. Mm -hmm. um, his voice has this incredible destructive power, so he mustn't speak. Mm -hmm. Yeah, All right. The, the Seeker breaks into Fantastic War and steals Dragon Man. Because he, the Seeker has mistaken the, uh, Dragon Man for an Inhuman. Mm -hmm. Oh, I can see the mistake. Sure. <laughs> it's understandable. Meanwhile, Ben and Black Bolt are duking it out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and the Seeker is mean and nasty to his um, his minions. Sure. Oh man! I mean, and even he is just the minion of Maximus, right. who we'll get to later. Yeah, indeed. But a huge fight. Oh, and Lockjaw gets into it. He holds uh, the thing down with a steel girder <laughs> with a yeah an eye beam. Yes. And Ben doesn't like it at all. <laughs> Surprise. Yeah, man. Cool fight. So they escape. The Inhumans escape. Yeah. And then Reed figures out how to chase them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's kind of, it's really cool. Oh, yeah. And we learn, do we learn some of the origins of the, the Inhumans as well? They yeah. were a genetic experiment by, an experiment uh, by the Kree. Mm. The aliens, the Kree. And um, yeah, um, they were mutated and advanced or whatever, mm -hmm. and and then they became uh, powerful geneticists themselves, yeah. developing all kinds of superpowers unique to each uh, specific inhuman. The humans um, were feared them, so they decided to hide. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, yeah, <laughs> the seeker smokes. <laughs> well. Isn't that it's kind of cool? He's got the coolest lighter ever. Yeah. Oh, Dragon Man wakes up. Well, we've been told this, and then Dragon Man wakes up and escapes, and there's a huge fight. Triton is a fish, and he's got to be in water all the time. Yeah. And he wears a armor or a water suit. Yeah, which is really cool. Mm -hmm. That's that's such a Kirby idea. <laughs> yeah, it's the exact opposite of a uh, wetsuit for humans. It's kind of yeah. neat. But uh, unlike Aquaman and uh, Namor, Namor, he cannot stand any time in the in the air. Yeah, which is probably far more accurate to this, someone who's like that. Sure. Uh, although later, I think there's something is developed, or a serum, or something is able to give into him, so he can survive outside of water. Yeah. But that's later. Mm hmm. Yep. Uh, next, beware the hidden land. Yeah. Hidden land sounds like. Um, Salad dressing. Well, sure. <laughs> oh, oh, Hidden Valley. Yeah. But, um, yeah, this is from uh, Fantastic Four number 47. Um, Stan Lee, Jack Kirby, and Joe Sinnott again. And um, this is just great stuff. Yeah. The Hidden Land, of course, referring to the great refuge of the Inhumans. Mm -hmm. Well, they save Triton with uh, Sue's force field. Force field. And uh, then Dra Dragon Man and Thing are fighting in front of Alicia's uh, apartment. How convenient. Yeah. Oh, here is more... Melodrama. Yeah. Uh, uh, Thing tells Alicia his you know, how he loves her and all that stuff. He's really sweet and nice. Yeah. And he said, get out of here because you're in danger and stuff. And so I still think Thing and Alicia is the best romance. Yeah. I... The most interesting, the most <sighs> tragic... Yeah. And the people are nice. Alicia's interesting. Thing yeah. is interesting. You know. Usually the, the girl is boring. A lot yeah. of times. Yeah, sure. A lot of times they're like, they're just a pretty girl. And because the hero is usually the guy. Mm -hmm. And that's usually who you focus on. Yeah. Um, and he's not trying to hide that he's a thing from her. She knows what he looks well, like. Well, yeah. I mean, there's not that uh, that weird tension like, uh, let's say, Matt Murdock and yeah. Betty. Or Will not he find not out? Betty Page. Yeah. Karen Page. <laughs> but he, will she find out that I'm Daredevil? You know? Yeah. Like, oh. <laughs> you know. But, but I don't know why the end. Although, to me, that's like the yeah. great and tragic love story in comics is Matt Murdock and Karen Page. Really? Yeah. Hmm. Um, but, yeah, I, but um, so they go they go back to the Great Refuge and the, the Inhumans and uh, meet Maximus. 
Yeah. Oh, I was thinking, all the villains are, they're doing villainy, but they're also mean guys. Yeah. And they treat their minions badly. And I'm trying to think of a one that doesn't um, in real life or not. I don't know. I guess Hitler was kind of nice. <laughs> no, that's so bad. But I mean, no, no, but his, well, his nice. Min- he was, he well, was nice to his secretary. His secretary said, oh, he's this nice, sweet guy. <laughs> and well, and then, his minions were like his buddies from like... Right. Uh, Unless you're Ernst Raw. <laughs> but, um, uh, the head of the SA, you had, I think, oh, he had shot. Yeah. Okay. Because he was getting too powerful. But, but yeah, Goebbels yeah. and Goring, those guys were like his buddies. Yeah. Um... That he he ordered a bunch of them killed, but yeah, generally he was you know like kids and dogs. But uh, in in fiction, the bad guys, bad you know, he does not only does he have evil schemes, but he's an evil god to everybody. Yeah. One exception I thought of the Godfather. Okay. The Godfather wanted to reason with people, so sure. it'd be in your best interest to take my liquor across state lines or something like that, sure. and then I'll pay you money. Mm-hmm. And this would work better than just you know, threatening them. Yeah. The Kingpin used threats, but yeah. he was also kind of like that, too. Yeah, That's probably why you like him a lot. Maybe so. Godfather is a great character. Yeah. And, um, but that's so rare. So sure. It would be kind of cool to have his, you know, like a Mr. Rogers evil guy. And, but he's, all, he's really super nice and all that stuff, but he's doing evil. You know? mm. Interesting. Be, yeah. 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 Um, super villains usually – it's so funny, though, because – even like the ineffectual supervillains, they're not very kind to their right. henchmen. Mm-hmm. Um, That's one of their They're always taking off their henchmen so that the henchmen aren't going to fight that well for them or they're going to um, stab them in the back. I did theorize about this before. That I think that's, that supervillains, they're, you know, they treat their henchmen badly because they, even if, you know, they have some softness in there somewhere, mm-hmm. they have to be ruthless because if you're just easy going you're mm-hmm. gonna have slacking henchmen you yeah. know i think the henchmen are like again they're desperate men usually right. career mm-hmm. criminals or you know ex-cons or whatever mm-hmm. they can't get good good work right um and also they are in their they're they've thrown in with wh- whatever villain this is because of the the lure or the promise of the wealth or a share of whatever mm-hmm. the villain is yeah. going to accomplish or hopes to get. Mm-hmm. So it's the hope of a better life for right. desperate men. Mm-hmm. So they'll take the abuse. Usually, right. mm-hmm. the only the only time you get rebelling henchmen, for the most part, is when they are also super villains with superpowers. They're like, mm-hmm. yeah, you know. I thought last week we saw. Uh, no, they weren't superheroes. So they. No, they, they they had super villains. Oh, it was some aim or something like that. They oh yeah, they were kind of they were rebelling against Modok because he was becoming yeah. too powerful. But that um, may be the exception proves the rule. Well, yeah, but but see that's fairly typical of aim because <laughs> it, we'll get on this tangent and we'll go back. But aim was a splinter group from from Hydra. Yeah. So they already have that like. Uh, rebelling against mm. the their whatever their authority figure is already. They were the science division of Hydra, and then mm. left for ideo- because of ideolog- ideological differences. Right. And then there have been like you know splits within AIM. So. Right. Hmm. Okay. But uh, yeah, Maximus is a creep. He's so like Loki. Without the charm. Yeah. And Loki yeah. is a little bit charming. Or a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. I mean. Maximus is, is I mean they refer to him brother, right? he is and he's re- referred to later as Maximus the Mad because he's crazy. Right. So he's been hanging on to the throne I guess for Black Bolt. Black Bolt takes it back and Maximus mm-hmm. pretends to be cool with it but of course he's not. And the Fantastic 4 are uh well seeking out the Inhumans so they find the great refuge. Yep. And uh, they're angry about it. <laughs> the Inhumans are and there's a, and then Maximus has a super weapon they're going to use, and we don't know what happens. Right, that's the end of that, yeah. and unfortunately, that's kind of the end of our our brief Not little too bad. our brief little Fantastic oh, Four block. I think I had this bicycle. What's the, the Raleigh, Raleigh bicycle? Yeah. yeah. 
Oh, um, but I had it in Salisbury. But it had the banana seat, which I thought was super comfortable compared to the regular seat. And they don't make them anymore. But yeah, and regular seat. Ape hanger, um, ape hanger handles. Yeah, I had a. I don't like the regular bicycle seats. They're really uncomfortable. But I had when I was a kid. I had an old Catalina Cruiser. It has big, wide bicycle wow. seat, which That's was great. great. Uh, it was just a very comfortable bicycle. And and on a uh, straightaway, I could just sit. And let go and and not even hold on to the handlebars. Wow! I could steer mm-hmm. with my hips almost. Yeah. So and, uh, learning how to ride a bike—that's just magical moments. Indeed. So. But so are comics. Magic <laughs> moments when <laughs> too hot. You know that's yeah. One? Yeah, I do. Very but not as well as you. <laughs> Oh, now we go to Iron Fist. Yeah, Iron Fist. And this is from, uh, we've got two issues in succession of Marvel Premiere. It's number 17 and number 18. The first, and this is also the, this is Iron Fist's first story arc. This is the, his third appearance. Mm-hmm. Um, Citadel on the Edge of Vengeance, written by Doug Munch, with art by Larry Hama and Dick Giordano. And uh, it's really interesting. Larry Hama is, I think, either at least on the first issue or so, the art was by Gil Kane. Mm-hmm. And if you look at this, he's Larry Hama is definitely trying to imitate Gil Kane, which is okay. Yeah. Oh, Citadel at the edge of fair, at the edge of vengeance is so pompous. And that's one of the problems with kung fu everything. It's yeah. Pomposity of it. <laughs> so that's how. That's why. Um, Kung Fu spoofs are usually so funny. <laughs> oh, sure. Uh, man. Well, this guy, Meacham, killed um, Iron Fist's father in a craven way <laughs> in, in a mountain. He stomps on his hands while he's on a bridge of frost. Sure. And so he falls to his death. And then he looks at <laughs> the kid, who will be Iron Fist, and just smirks. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that's cold. Yeah, it's pretty cold. But, man... Iron Fist <laughs> is going for vengeance, and he goes to, to Meacham's yeah. penthouse or whatever, and it's just loaded with death traps. Yeah. Um, a very cool ones, but poorly situated. It has three... <laughs> uh, spikes come out of the wall, and they don't bother Iron Fist. And three machine guns, all four, pop up, and... You know, if they were situated on the corners of the room up high, sure. he'd be dead. But yeah. but it's kind of cool. I would, I would like to meet have <laughs> some of these uh, <laughs> machine guns <laughs> that come out of the floor. It look they look cool as all get out. Yeah. So and man, there's a nut. It just at one yeah. point something drops some acid on him, but it doesn't like really get him too bad. Or... Yeah, and it, it makes him mad though. So, yeah. <laughs> Oh, and there's stairs that fall away and are electrocuted and all, all kinds, kinds of, stuff. of stuff. It keeps on going. Three businessmen who are not businessmen, but they are assassins. And, yeah. And they are in turn assassinated. <laughs> well, does Iron Fist kill him? Does he? I thought he just beats him up. Maybe he just beats him up, but they die of shame. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Oh, What's but, interesting is Iron Fist doesn't say anything until like the last panel of the comic. Um, that's another thing about it. It's in um, second person narrative. Yeah, we're getting all his inner monologue, which is great mm-hmm. in uh, in these uh, in just the the thought uh, or the boxes, yeah. um, not even thought balloons, right. which is very common now. Is it? To, now it seems like the, the boxes, the narrative boxes, have kind of replaced thought balloons. You yeah. get the inner monologue in a narrative box rather than thought balloons. But um, I like thought balloons, but uh, yeah, either um, one works as long as you can establish that it's not the narrator speaking, that it's our character. Right. Um, and usually they'll differentiate that by, well, putting the, what they're saying in quotes mm-hmm. and having the box colored differently than whatever the, the regular right. narration. There's a radio show... Uh, I don't think it, it may have been the Whistler, but I'm not sure. The Whistler. Yeah, and it was just, it's like, um, oh, Twilight Zone, as in the, the stories were new each. No, no oh yeah, it's an anthology series. Anthology. Can't think of that word. But it, there'd be a narrator, and 
and they'd be actors, and the narrative says, well, you thought you'd get away with it, didn't you? But you didn't. <laughs> yeah, something like that. Yeah. yeah. You shouldn't have killed that person in front of 40,000 people. <laughs> you know, something like, and it, just, yeah. it went all the way through that. And that. I, I'm being silly, but I'm exaggerating, but it's kind of it's kind of cool. But, that is cool. Yeah. But it's, uh, we got, Iron Fistfuls is the mailbox. I always love the names of the oh. mailbox. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man, okay, he just goes through... The letter call title is what that is. Yeah. yeah. I mean, no, but he goes through elevators and doors and he meets a, a samurai janitor. <laughs> and it's we could call him a janitor. Yeah. Janitor. <laughs> he is saved by somebody, uh, by a ninja. And we're I mean, not sure what the devil's going on with that. So yeah. We never, we, it is never explained. Okay. It's kind of cool. Yeah. So, continuing that very story, we got Marvel premiere number 18, and the story is Law of Shattered Vengeance. Yeah, it comes into, what's this guy's name? Triple R, who has a triple... Uh, Nunchuck. Nunchucks. And he's like, is he a cyborg, or has he wear got a super suit? He's wearing a super suit, he's in this um, room for 10 years, getting stronger and bigger and nastier. Okay. And it's giving him his power. So, he beats up Iron Fist, pretty good. Yeah. There's a book called Marathon Man, and in the uh, book... Who, who wrote that? I'm not sure. I know. Good okay. book, good movie. Okay. And one of the killers has this uh, mysterious weapon from the East where he freaks out his victims, and, and it's so cool that, you know, no one knows how to fight it. And all of a sudden, Bruce Lee comes around, and then everyone, every kid in the world can use nunchucks. <laughs> yeah. I, I thought that was amusing. That um, it's a, I, you know, it's it's an occupational hazard that your cool weapon is going to be used by ten year old boys. <laughs> sure, but it's uh, they are cool. But this is one with triple, so it's even yeah. nastier than regular nunchucks. I guess. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> but here's a mysterious ninja throwing a. Uh, throwing star. Yeah. Or sh shuriken? Shuriken. 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 But sh throwing star also works. People know. That it's, yeah. it's known by both of those. I had one, a big one, and it was hard to throw. Like, sideways? Yeah. I had to sling it. I think you have to throw it overhand. You can't throw it sideways. So well, they much. always do in the movies. with, with side Yeah, but that's movies. <laughs> yeah. But they wouldn't lie. <laughs> Jeff, I hate to break it to you. Oh, no. <laughs> Motion pictures <laughs> contain scenes that cannot actually work in real life. Oh, um, man. So I'm not going to get the girl. Oh. <laughs> you got the girl. Oh, that's right. Yeah. Yeah, yeah you got a redhead, too. Good yeah, job. Indeed. Mm -hmm. Indeed. So he finally kills... Um, what's his name? Triple, Triple Iron. Triple Iron. <laughs> Good. Oh. What a stupid name. Thank yeah. God he's just a one-off villain. Yeah. I don't know. You take him to play golf or something. <laughs> yeah. uh, although it's, I don't know, is it any worse or better than the Revenger that the Karate Kid fought? What was on that issue we no. read a couple weeks ago? I guess they want to be Avenger, but that's what they've taken twice. So yeah. So they finally meets Meacham, and Meacham has no legs, skulls. He was after he had killed Iron Fist's father. He had frostbite or something, frostbite, right? And yeah. What a big jerk. So he's been afraid of him coming, of uh, Iron Fist's revenge. Mm -hmm. And now he's ready to die. Yeah. And Iron Fist kind of like feels sorry for him and just decides to get the, the better revenge is to let him live. Mm -hmm. And That's we kind of get a glimpse of Iron, Iron Fist's origin and training in this too. Right. But then here comes a um, ninja. Ninja. And he's shooting him with a Luger, which is the coolest handgun ever. Yeah. So, and... So, the ninja kills Meacham. With his... And he leaves a samurai sword. So, I spent a decade making a samurai sword, and you leave it inside of a body. I'd take that home. Dramatic yeah. purposes. All right. But, uh, I don't know, it's... You leave a murder weapon, I think it's... Maybe the idea is to implicate Iron Fist? Make it look like he did, especially because he was there for revenge anyway. Yeah, but you know it's already a sword, and yeah. And Meacham's beautiful blonde daughter comes in. 
Yeah. And now she thinks that Iron Fist killed her, killed him, and uh, promises revenge. So it continues. Yeah. So we're gonna take a little uh, detour to uh, uh, <laughs> post-apocalyptic America with Samson. Mighty Samson, yes, from Gold Key Comics, and it's Mighty Samson number twenty-five. Mm-hmm. And uh, the story is called The Fugitives. A couple things about this issue: one, we have no stupid backup story with Tom Morrow. Thank Ooh, wow. God. Yeah. And uh, second, it's an entirely new creative team, uh, which yeah. the, uh, written by Jerry Boudreaux and uh, with art by Jose Delbo and Jack Abel. And mm-hmm. I believe they would finish out the series. I'm not sure quite when yeah. they took over, but... Yeah. I approve of their change of Char- Charmaine's uh, clothes. Yeah. yeah. She wears hot pants and boots. <laughs> Pretty awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I think I, I just like the art, art on this issue a lot better. I I, 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 I enjoy like the other one better, to tell you the truth. Okay. It's kind of more. This is kind of more new, and it's, the old one kind of had a old school charm. I don't know. This has like a. It's clearer what's going on, and I don't mm-hmm. know. Okay, I think it's more regular, and and the oh, other Mighty Samson was so oddball. I, I enjoyed it. Yeah. Oh, I don't like the Giganto rat. And, uh, so what's going on in the story? They say these people... <laughs> oh my god. They say, what the devil was that thing called? It was like a mole worm or Mole something. worm, yeah. And it's but, another radioactive monster yeah, thing, so, mutation. So they, yeah, they kill it with gasoline. But they, they're, um, These people were attacked by the mole worm, wanted to be sacrificed. So they're now they're mad that they were not sacrificed and they're going to anger the rest of their tribe. Uh, yeah, total idiots. Because yeah, worship cause... from mole worms. <laughs> yeah, for crying out loud. Yeah, but uh, now if the all girl tries could... to kill him, and right? Tries to kill Samson, and Samson forgives her, which, which is pretty cool. Yeah, then they're attacked by the the tribe, and uh, there's a big fight. Samson wins, of course. Yeah, uh, but the the bad guy in charge, the head priest. Mm-hmm. He sees a big duck, and he thinks that's a uh, the a, a worm. Yeah. God. So he tries to bring a life, and he kills himself in order to cause blood makes yeah. him live. So sure. Uh, but they try to see the error of their ways, yeah. and everybody's happy. It's really weird to see a suicide in a gold key comic. It's weird to see a suicide in any comic. It's not that often. It's yeah, it's not common, but especially if, especially for Gold Key, you, you know, they're kind of their oh. whole deal was yeah. kind of toned down. Oh, stuff. And yeah, something else. Charmaine actually does something. She beats. She knocks him down on the top of the head. Or so well, because she's first... like the damsel in distress, like throughout the whole series. Yeah, she hasn't done a thing. So complain and oh my god, where's Samson? Or right. Samson's in danger. Right. Hmm. Yeah, that's a very good point. I'm going to breeze right through that, huh? No, oh, what's there to say? It, <laughs> yeah. it was okay. Yeah. Well, I know you'd been really enjoying the Mighty Samson books. So. so we say goodbye to Saint Mighty Samson, I guess. So. We do. Um, but not to say that we won't uh, uh, see him okay. someday in the future. I enjoy show. the Terra one. She's a good villain. Terra of Jers? Yeah. You know, Dark Horse Comics uh, a couple years ago had a, a brief revival of... Uh, of Mighty Samson. I should, oh, really? I should okay. find those issues and, nice. and get them for you. Yeah, I was going to say, no, Terra of Oregon City. <laughs> oh, my gosh. But, uh, that's funny. Yes, because Dark Horse Comics is in Oregon. Is that where you're... No, no, no. That's where I live. So. Oh, oh, okay. <laughs> I was trying to think of a silly name in Oregon. So, Oregon City. That sounds... Okay. It's a little silly. So. Okay. All right. There Very exciting. Go to the new gods. Well, what's wrong with the old gods? Moloch was good enough for my dad and his dad, so it's good <laughs> enough for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, let me tell you. Here's the thing, Jack Kirby. These characters that first, okay, we're we're talking about the new gods, number one, and it's one of Jack Kirby's wonderful things he did at DC mm-hmm. in the '70s. But originally, this concept and these characters were going to be at Marvel. Mm-hmm. The new gods were born after. We're supposed to be born after the death of the old gods, the Norse gods, mm-hmm. the the ones we see in Thor and Marvel Comics, yeah. um, in on the day of Ragnarok. Right. And then this saga is supposed to be kind of like from the ashes of that. Mm-hmm. Um, so, yeah. Oh. Um, so, it's not connected, but conceptually it was supposed to be. Mm-hmm. 
And this is also supposedly be a limited run. Yeah, it only ran, uh, it was supposed to be a finite series, you're absolutely right. And it uh, originally, Jack Kirby's run on it was 11 issues. Um, and then they revived it uh, in the late 70s, and we'll talk about that also. But what's happening in this very first issue? There's a heck of a lot. Yeah, but uh, <laughs> the story is Orion Fights for Earth. Of course, it's written and drawn by Jack Kirby with mm -hmm. uh, inks by Vince Coletta. Oh, it's gorgeous. Oh, my gosh. Every page is just fantastic. Mm -hmm. So we're meeting Orion of yeah. the New Gods. Yeah, he's kind of a square. He's very serious. And he meets Light Ray. Who he's, is really fun, and he's like just he's yeah. he's very jovial and loves life. Yeah, nonsense! To so laugh is a feel a beat of life. Let live, Orion, live. Uh, and Orion's not having any of that. Yeah. <laughs> so you know the story about uh, with Orion, right? How he's actually the son of Darkseid. Right, right, right. I didn't know that. Yes, he and uh, Mister Miracle uh, were as part of a treaty with the uh, well, okay, New Genesis is where the home of the the New Gods, yeah. uh, and Apocalypse, the world that Darkseid rules. Mm -hmm. um, they had their their peace treaty involved trading sons, and uh, Isaiah, the I, the All Father, High Father, uh, High Father yeah. of the New Gods, sent his son uh, Scott Free, Mister Miracle, to be raised by Darkseid, and Isaiah raised Darkseid's son Orion, mm -hmm. and Orion looks handsome um, because um, of his mother box, the, the living computer, makes him look handsome, but he's actually ugly. Like, huh. like his brother Calabac. Oh, okay. If uh, that's not uh, complicated enough for you, oh yeah, keep reading. Because <laughs> yes. we meet Metron and his, he's got his wonderful Mobius chair, and he can tra tra travel mm. anywhere on the Mobius chair. Yeah. So High Father is above um, Dark Side. Well, it kind of seems like he's in defiance of. of or later on, he, um, Dark Side and in, in disobeyed High Father. You can't disobey someone who is your equal. Yeah. Right, but you have to remember that Apocalypse is basically this barren world, and they these are all members of the same race, yeah. but they've separated to these worlds. Mm -hmm. You know, New Genesis is lush and untouched and beautiful, and, uh, and Apocalypse is this whole of just burning wasteland. Right. You know, and it's just war and disease and evil. Yeah. Like you know. Newark. <laughs> uh, um, yeah, it's a bunch of, man there's a bunch of new characters some really cool stuff I think the High Lord is the only person who is entertained by children's choirs <laughs> you, know, sure. you go to a children's choir because your child's in it yeah I mean I yeah, I I don't know anyone who. Hey, children's choir, let's go. Let's but but think about it, a children's choir on New Genesis is probably like better than the Mormon ta Mormon Tabernacle Choir probably here. So. They are wearing cool helmets. So I want those helmets. Yeah. Mm. But, oh. You want Jack Kirby to design your world? Yes, I do. Oh, that's another Me too, idea. Though. Oh, oh. Wouldn't here. this be a great idea if someone can make an animated movie? using Jack Kirby's drawings. Or, you know, draw it in the style of Jack Kirby. Wouldn't that be awesome? Yes. It'd be almost impossible. I, I mean, know, Bruce Tim, the animator, I mean, you, there's definitely Kirby-esque aspects mm -hmm. to his stuff. Um, I've seen animation that definitely kind of emulates it. If you watch the uh, the Marvel superheroes cartoons from the 60s, they basically, it's it's basically the, the first motion comics because they basically just took still images from comics and just kind of moved an arm or whatever. And you get to see... Jack Kirby's original art all throughout that. Yeah, that's kind of. But I don't know. It's awesome. It's, I don't like him as a kid. And the those shows. Maybe I need to watch them again. But and it's they're like they just take those stories and just kind of. I love. They always had great uh, make theme the songs. When Captain America throws his <laughs> mighty shield. <laughs> See, I love that one, and that's that's all Kirby throughout yeah. that whole one. Mm -hmm. um, but and the Thor I think is all Kirby, and the Hulk one sh mm -hmm. mostly. Yeah. yeah. Anyway. Yeah, man, this is so chock full of weird Kirby f stuff. The yeah. source, which writes on the wall, you know. And the source is like where the is where life comes from. They're talking about God. Mm -hmm. You know, which is cool. Yeah. I don't like the name Dark Side or Apocalypse. No. It, no, it's just too obvious. Or something. Well, Kirby sort of... wasn't known for his subtlety. 
Yeah. But he, but he sure was known for a great imagination. Indeed, indeed. And when you give him free reign to create, mm -hmm. you get stuff that's so bonkers yeah. and awesome. Mm -hmm. Oh, but the place Apocalypse is cool. <laughs> it's just like, uh, I don't know. <laughs> it's like a ball of... Oh, I can't even explain it. It's so gorgeous. <laughs> yeah, it, it's awfulness. Think of like a moon with just covered with buildings and huge flaming pits that you could see from space. Yeah. Like the, you, you could. It, the, it looks like huge, the Death Star with yeah. like big old holes right. and burning on it. And the, the holes are the size of that huge um, crater on the moon we see. Uh, sure. And uh, that's yeah, that's how big they are. So it must be an unpleasant place to live. Yeah. I bet rent's cheap, though. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well. Well, Ryan goes to Apocalypse to visit his father, the I think. Because told him to, they wrote it on, on yeah. the wall with his finger, with this, right. like, uh... Yeah. yeah. And so he comes into battle with, oh, parademons and monster dogs and all kinds of cool uh, stuff. Yeah, Darkseid has dog cavalry. Sure. That's kind of cool, so... That's... And, of course, Brother Calabac is there. Yeah... Yeah, he's a caveman looking guy. And yeah. He's got the, the nice stick. Yeah, he's got this big club and he can do different stuff with it, but. Mm -hmm. I've always liked Calabac, I gotta say. Really? Okay, I only sent him once, he was okay. Um, he's mean. <laughs> yeah. That he yeah. is. So, Darkseid got these humans and was doing research on them, so. Yeah, Darkseid wants to, because of the, the treaty with uh, New Genesis, he's going to have a front against them on Earth. And, of course, he was uh, uh, giving weapons to Intergang, which I know you're aware of, mm -hmm. like in Metropolis and stuff. And, yeah, he's kidnapped a few hum humans through a boom tube, and Orion is rescuing them in this issue. And, and now they're going to help him try to fight Darkseid on Earth. Yeah. Nice story about Jack Kirby. Uh, yes, written by Marv Wolfman, who was one of the great uh, writers in comics himself. Oh, and uh, oh, he yeah. he and Len Wein actually visit, did a lot, spent a lot of time visiting Jack Kirby in his home. Yeah. This is a wonderful comic. It's great. It's I need to reread it because it's so complex stuff going on. Oh yeah, I mean I I I need to get the nice hardcover versions of that collect Kirby's uh, Fourth World Saga in their entirety, and of course so that includes New Gods. Uh, Mr. Miracle, the Forever People, and his stuff in Jimmy Olsen. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, but it's um, it's you put it together and it's this great big amazing saga. Mm -hmm. So, this oh one of the goofiest things I've ever seen in a comic book. Advertisements for hot now have fun and make money with hand shadows. About <laughs> the most ridiculous thing. Although I love this guy does the this one of of Dick Nixon. Mm -hmm. That's really fun. I remember this. Uh, I remember this ad. And the TV star, Almazino. Al Almazino? Hang on, hand it to me. <laughs> Almazino. Almazino, oh yeah. Weird, yeah. Albert Almazino. That's a weird name. Yeah. And then the very last ad is Holloway Candies, which are the low-rent candies. Slowpoke, Milk Does, and Black Cow. Hmm. Yeah, Black Cow and Slowpoke, they... I've never had them, but milk duds, sure. Eh, I don't like them, but okay. They're okay. It's... What do you do? So, I think I mentioned earlier that Kirby's run on the New Gods only ran 11 issues. Mm -hmm. um, but uh, in the late 70s, uh, DC decided to revive it and revive the property and, and continue some of those adventures, or adventures with those characters. Mm -hmm. um, and so we've got... Uh, the Return of the New Gods, and this series started in an issue of, well, they did a one-off in an issue of First Issue Special. And then there's this, which is the New Gods number 12. And mm. uh, the story is called Prelude to a Holocaust. And I, I want to talk about the creative team on this, though. I mean, uh, Jerry Conway wrote it, and hey, cool, he's a fine artist, or a fine writer, um, with art by Don Newton and Dan Adkins. And... I like Don Newton. I, I enjoyed his stuff on the Phantom over at Charlton, mm -hmm. and his uh, Batman and his Captain Marvel stuff at DC are cool. But I think what an odd choice for him to pick this up. I mean, DC had a couple of guys in house who were very good at imitating Kirby. Why mm -hmm. not utilize them? 
you've got Ernie Chan on the payroll, yeah. get him, use him. Or Keith Giffen, who took over Commandy. Perhaps they had they were doing something else. Something yeah, I mean, more. it's just a weird choice. I mean, I like Don Newton, but good grief! If if you've got a, a somebody on hand who can imitate Kirby, why not utilize them? Yeah. And this revival only ran, I think, eight issues. Mm -hmm. So yeah, weird. It's mm -hmm. weird. Mm -hmm. Nothing against Don Newton, thing. but I just think an odd choice. Yeah. And I like to be a fly on the wall sometimes. Yeah. Wonderful two page spread of. Uh, I don't know what's going on. Just space and <laughs> yeah, stuff. And look, we get, get kind of like the floating space. dark side head mm -hmm. in space. It looks awesome. Yes, it's cool. The, because the menace of dark side is ever present. His mm -hmm. shadow is over, is looming. You know, that kind of thing. So it, it opens the new gods. Uh, they're in battle. And we got Orion and uh, and Forager and a couple of. And I think okay, Light Ray. Jezebel. Um. There's Light Ray, Forager, uh, I think I saw, God, what in the world is his name, with the Mobius chair? Oh, I can never remember. I already forgot, I can't believe it. But anyway, that guy, people who are listening were like, duh, <laughs> but I'm already blanking um, on his stupid name. No, for crying out loud. Here, I'm gonna Metron. Look. Metron, I can't believe <laughs> I could, we were just talking about Metron and I can't remember. Oh, oh. welcome to my world. I know, I'm afraid of that. Oh, you ought to be, it's... It's horrible. <laughs> oh, so they they go to dark um the apocalypse They're looking for dark side and then dark side's gone and out what? to lunch. Yeah, but they fight a bunch of his uh, minions, a bunch of the parademons and stuff. And apparently, somebody left what they're going to do on the computer screen. So there are these a bunch of people around the United States. Apparently, no, there, there's one Eskimo. Right, and, and these were people that were in the in Kirby's run, and they're they're bringing them back. Mm -hmm. These are human characters, but so I can't believe Darkseid's plan got left on like the computer right. monitor screen. I bet he's really gonna get mad at Desaad later. Yeah. <laughs> mm -hmm. Oh, so Orion goes to meet meet the general, and he busts down two jets. Oh, this is Earth Four, right? What do you mean? Oh, the fourth world? Yeah, fourth world. Kirby's fourth world is not necessarily separate from, like, the DC multiverse. It's not like... Uh, like, when they come to Earth, it's Earth 1. Yeah. It's not like another mm -hmm. Earth that's not tied to the rest of the DCU. Oh, okay. That's a good question, though. Hmm. Okay, I was kind of confused by I don't that. know why it's called the fourth world, to be honest. I don't know. <laughs> it's just sort of... I feel sad for some of the writers to keep up with the canon and keep it <laughs> can they do? But it's fun though too. Yeah. I mean so Yeah, hey, we got another mean general. Yeah. What's his name? Um uh -oh. Maxwell Torch. Yeah. And he doesn't like Orion. And he calls he calls him Orion like a, it, it's like an Irish name. Yeah, I thought that was pretty funny, actually. Yeah, but um, I think that was used also in, in Kirby's uh, original run of New mm -hmm. Guns. So it's yeah. a clever thing, and it's, mm -hmm. and it's nice to share that, have some carryover. Yeah. Forger doesn't, he meets some nerd in the computer. <laughs> <laughs> and he hasn't, doesn't have that much trouble. Yeah. Because uh, some people are reasonable, so. All right. And Lonar meets... No Mac and uh, oh the Eskimo mm -hmm. yeah and doesn't Light Ray go and meet this junkie? He goes to San Francisco. Oh <laughs> okay, that oh, perfect my. place for Light Ray. Yeah, indeed. <laughs> yeah. <sighs> yeah. <laughs> oh boy, so. Yeah. So yeah, they're trying to round up these these people to help mm -hmm. them or whatever. Because stored within each of these humans' minds is a piece of Darkseid's plan, or a part of the anti-life equation, yeah. which is Darkseid's eternal quest to like mm -hmm. dominate stuff. <laughs> yeah. But, so Orion is is ignored and he gets mad and he escapes. And then he says he's going to bring down Darkseid, and so this breaks the truce. Well, it's kind of odd. It's here's a, the thing: if New Genesis and Apocalypse go to war like 
in space or on mm -hmm. their world, yes, that's breaking the truce. But on a, I think if it's happening on Earth, that's different. It's it's a neutral territory, and that's why Dark Side wanted but, to use Earth as his beachhead. Yeah, but uh, yes, right. The battle begins anew. The pact which kept the Hounds of War at bay has indeed been broken. So okay, it's yes. like war. Okay, so okay, and Apoc and Dark Side cops to it. Then there you go. <laughs> I, there's a there's a wonderful house ad that I want to show up here. This this uh, uh, house ad uh, advertising several new series that DC is coming out with. Um, you've got the Secret Society of Supervillains, which we'll be talking about a big chunk of issues of that very cool. soon. Um, the Return of the New Gods, which of course we just just talked about, yeah. and the Freedom Fighters, which were the Golden Age heroes uh, from quality comics. You got Uncle hmm. Sam. And the Black Condor and the Ray and Doll Man and oh, the Human Bomb. Man. I want to read those. Yeah. One of my very uh, first comics from when I was a kid was an issue of DC Comics Presents where Superman journeyed to Earth X to help the Freedom Fighters fight the Nazis. Hmm. It was great. Yeah, cool. So, so we've got more Kirby craziness in the form of OMAC number six. And the story is called The Body Bank. This yeah. is written and drawn by Jack Kirby. Very nice inks by D. Bruce Berry. Yeah, there's um, they're going to get going after this body bank. Um, Omac and this guy, I think he's a stoolie or something. Yeah. And watch out for the sickies. What are they? And you see one, and it's a glorious uh, drawing of the sickie, which we find out later are criminals that take these drugs to make them powerful and and unfortunately ugly. Mm-hmm. So, but uh. Yeah. Man, that'd have to be a lot of money. Yeah. To make, to but check this like out. That. The body bank is probably making a lot of black market money. And mm -hmm. what the body bank are doing, first of all, Brother Eye, has a, which is a cool sp satellite in space mm -hmm. that alerts OMAC to danger and stuff that he needs to take care of. Um, but the body bank, they it's a gang of, they kidnap people and then rich old folks transplant their, bot, their brains into healthy young bodies so they can live again yeah. and again. Uh, this was a plot of, no, it wasn't so, it was a little bit science fiction-y, but it's a movie with Rock Hudson called Seconds, which is really a very good film, very creepy. Rock Hudson does a great job, and uh, he he has this manic episode of just total fear, and yeah. suppose there's a rumor, I'm not sure if it's true or not, that he was being called out for being gay, okay. and he, and, and it he brought it to his um, acting there. But oh, it's really okay. Well done. Um, he was going out with Jim uh, Neighbors. Jim Neighbors, who would drive up each day at the end of, of the work, you know, the filming, and wearing in a in a convertible with a fur coat on and nothing else. Oh my God! <laughs> so, um, but. I actually like Jim Neighbors and I like Rock Hudson. Sure. Both good actors. Uh, oh, Jim Neighbors is a good comic actor. Well, sure. Um, and a great singer, too. Oh, yeah. It's just, what a great idea to do yeah. that. But at the end of the day, who cares that they're gay? Right. They were great. Yeah. And that, people they care be... then. Right. And that's what calls it. But... Well, I'm saying now. I mean, like, who cares? They yeah. were great and they should be remembered for being great. Mm -hmm. And that's, a, and then the fact they were gay is part of who they were. So what? Yeah. Having said that, Rock Hudson could have done better than Jim Neighbors. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, I, I was at least Tab Hunter. Come yeah, on. Yeah. <laughs> Tab Hunter, terrible actor, but he was a handsome guy. All right. So, he was a decent actor. I mean, not great. And hmm. well, wasn't he sort of like a teen idol pop singer first, and maybe, then got into movies? Maybe. I can't remember. Yeah. Hmm. To the internet. Yeah. <laughs> All right. So, so Omac is busting up the body bank. Yeah. Which is. It doesn't seem like that big a deal for a one-man army corps. I mean, the battles of Guadalcanal and the battles or of North Africa were for, fought by an army corps. You know? Okay, that's a big deal. Tens of thousands of men, and he's going at this body bank. You know, Sam Spade could have done this, or well, somebody. Well, it's still you know. pretty cool, and it's oh yeah, it's cool, but yeah, it. I don't know. It was, if you're a one-man army corps, you should be able to do more than that. I don't know, but it's like Omek is kind of like a superhero and a super spy, too. And a super policeman. Yeah. And because the regular policeman cannot use violence. 
Yeah. So he's doing kinda, outside it's, of the, It's interesting. Yeah. Um, Do you think Omak could beat Captain America? Huh. That'd be a great fight. Could he beat Captain America? Hmm. Probably. Because uh, Captain America is strong, but he's not Army Corps strong. And he doesn't have this... Um, big brother, uh, brother eye, telling him where to go and yeah, what to do and, and stuff. power and all that stuff. So he yeah. should be able to beat him. Yeah. But anyway, Omak is pretty sweet, mm -hmm. and he fights the bad guys and saves a kid who is about to become the receptacle for some old man's yeah. brain. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So there's this train that comes, and and the train comes and just picks up three, um, I guess, two guys and the captive girl. Yeah, but um, but Omac beats up the guys, lets the girl go free, brings his dually on, and um, the train um, is supposed to carry three. He's only carrying two, so the train's defenses go against him. Interesting. It it, it kind of was, but it's a lot of stuff just for one girl, you know. Well, but see, you have to think this is a kidnapping ring that mm -hmm. Omac is busting up. Yeah. So this is she's he's saving this one girl this time, but he's saving all these people. Oh no no! no. I'm not talking about the train and just all this huge, uh, super sophisticated train is going to carry one girl. You know. Yeah, but it's think about it, it's funded by the super rich, and they don't care how much it costs. You know, I can. Oh, they want to make a profit. But, or they want to live forever. Or something. Yeah. Yeah. So that's oh. where the villainy lies. Mm -hmm. Incidentally, do you know who uh, created Brother Eye? Built Brother Eye? Who? Bruce Wayne. Really? Yeah. Okay. That's a retcon later, but isn't that awesome? Yeah, it is. Man, it's really cool. So the people know, the bad guys know that the train has got some good guys on it. So yeah. they, they lay a trap for it, and it's a really cool trap. Bunch of guns and cool machine guns. Yeah. Or cannon, actually. Laser rifle. Uh, I'd call it something else, but... yeah. Um, awesome. Yeah, this is just Kirby awesome sauce all over. <laughs> I love that. And <laughs> so they get through the, the um, they make a molecular shell. Yeah. Cocoon. Yeah. And this, and it can't be hurt. So. Man, but um, uh, it's this really cool story. There's this old guy who's in charge of it, and he wants a, no, I guess it's one of their, um, Clients, Clients. Of the body of the yeah the body bank super ugly and getting a reserved body for him yeah and Omac yeah. comes and stops the operation yeah and that's about it yeah the the Stooley doesn't like um, didn't want to come yeah and he's angry about it. But he finds his girlfriend. Omak finds his girlfriend. Yeah. And that's the end of the story. Okay. But next week is Dr. Scuba, the Ocean Stealer. Which, we don't have that one. Yeah, but, but it's uh, kind of interesting. Yeah, but, uh, it should be cool. Scuba is kind of a scary name, I guess. Yeah. Boy, we've got some, uh, some, some great DC war comics to talk about. Now, we've got Our Fighting Forces... Number 102, and the lead story is called Cold Steel for a Hot War. It's written by Robert Conagher, with art by Jack Abel. Yeah, and Robert Conagher was probably, he and uh, Gardner Fox are both known for being probably the most prolific writers in comics, period. Hmm. So, guys who wrote literally thousands of comic book stories. Now, Conagher mostly in war mm -hmm. books, but, mm -hmm. but yeah. Yeah, um... This is written in 1966. We had just started sending troops over there, but all the tropes from Vietnam is here, it seems. Yeah. The booby traps, the people you can't trust, um, the POWs, um, a nasty war, and all that stuff. And it's kind of, and I was kind of surprised that they're already here now, at that time. Sure. Not a bad fight. Um, Who's our POV character? Was it Captain Hunter? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and uh, starring Captain Hunter. And his brother is a POW. Yeah, he's trying oh, to There's a punji stick, uh, stakes, uh, punji sticks, um, traps, and a beautiful Vietnamese woman. So. Who he doesn't know if he can trust. Right. 
So they meet this village of kids whose parents were killed. Mm -hmm. and, and these kids want to fight. fight the VC, mm -hmm. yeah. That's another Rock Hudson movie. What? Um, it's some World War II film where he helps this you know, group of kids who fight against the Nazis. Huh. You know? They blow up a bridge or something. So it's kind of cool. Um, I think I may have seen that in Sergeant Rock, too. Yeah. Sergeant Rock Hudson. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay. That's right. I went I'm there. I'm not going to go any further. Either, so. Okay. No, but it's kind of it's uh, it's kind of sad because they don't know. That... Sergeant Hunter doesn't really want to help these kids fight because he's like ah you know whatever. But they turn out to be good fighters and good soldiers. Mm -hmm. But they sacrifice themselves to defeat the Viet Cong. And yeah, a lot of them die. Yeah. But that's cool. Oh, let's see. We've got another story. Periscope quarterback. Yeah, and this is by, uh, written by Bob Haney with beautiful art by Russ Heath. It is nice. Yeah. Um, this is odd. Russ Heath was just given some major uh, comics industry award for like a lifetime achievement yeah. or whatever. I was I can't. I wish I could remember what it was. It wasn't like the Harvey Award, but it was something like that. Yeah. But. Um, I huh. didn't know he was still alive. Mm -hmm. so. The uh, German destroyer, which they didn't have any by the time America was in the war, they had all been sunk. Mm. But so, um, submarine action against the Germans wasn't that much because they didn't have that many ships. Okay. But that's okay. Um, a nice cat and mouse um, game, which is submarine warfare is very cool cat and mouse. And sure. Kind of, it's it's no, they're using Star Trek. It's evasion. It's it's, yeah, it's try to set a trap or mm -hmm. trick somebody into yeah. thinking. It's like playing chess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and know? it's easier to play this display. You, you can do cat and mouse in warfare, but it's in like land battles, but it's harder to show. But you got two ships, and it's easy to show them what's going on. Sure, it, it makes it easier. So. Um, the ship is doing this, ship is doing it, the ship's doing that. Yeah. So It's called uh, Periscope Quarterback because the guy who's leading the submarine crew he uses an old football play from his ball playing days. Mm -hmm. uh, and he, that works. He implements this in, in submarine battle and yay, he, they beat the Nazis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but it was a pretty cool story and like I said, gorgeous art. So we got, oh, you thought we were done with Jack Kirby for this episode? Oh, you were wrong, sir. <laughs> We've got Our Fighting Forces, number 156. Uh, the story is good good <laughs> shoot. Goodbye, Broadway. Hello, Death. <laughs> <laughs> Which, come on. <laughs> yeah. But um, it's with the written and drawn by Jack Kirby and inked by Mike Royer. And this mm. is his war hero team, the Losers. And they are on shore leave. Mm -hmm. But there's no rest for the fight against the Nazis, yeah. even in New York City. I was looking, oh, it looks, it looks okay, okay. Then I turn and look at the front page, and I turn the page. And Big, it, beautiful two-page splash. Of a, a freighter being blown up, and it was awesome. It was just yeah. amazing. Okay, so there's a submarine, they're sinking ships. And it was a trap by the Allies, mm -hmm. and they, they destroy the submarine, capture some guys. But one, the guy they want is got away, so they, which is ridiculous. Trying to find somebody, driving around in a cab, trying to find find somebody in New York City is absurd. Right. But they find him, because <laughs> an old guy drops a paper. <laughs> so. Right. <sighs> So, Helmut Steger. Yeah. Is that his name? Yeah. Oh, man. That's bad. Yeah, not a great one. But he's a Nazi, so, mm -hmm. yeah. <laughs> he's got to go. Yep. So, oh. the Losers is this ragtag team of, uh, of uh, soldiers of diff from different branches of the military, and they've teamed up as kind of a special forces unit. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and uh, the plot, the German plot, is to shoot a missile at Broadway. Oh. Or at least Manhattan. And they shoot a Henschel HS-293, which actually exists, and this is a very good depiction of it. Very nice. you got to remember, Kirby was also in the Army, too, so... Mm -hmm. That's kind of cool. 
So they they get onto the German U boat and they fight and they win. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, very um, nice. Very dramatic. Yeah. Um, the problem with war books is that they're so predictable. The bad guy's gonna lose, and it already and it happens in regular comics as well, mostly. But it's always oh they get away or something like that or you know, yeah. their plans fail. But in war comics. It's just, there's very few recurring characters, you know, like, you're going to, what, 20 million people are fighting World War II, you're not going to meet the same guy fighting over and over again. Right. It's, and, but, you know, you, the only way to win in war is to kill your enemy, so kill them, and that's, you, that's the last you see of that. Sure. There's some recurring Baron Stuker. And well, the, sure, and uh, I think Sergeant Rocky had this guy, the Iron... Corporal, or the Iron General, or Iron something. Major. The Iron Major was a recurring yeah. Sergeant Rock villain. Mm-hmm. But other than that, yeah, it was just fighting just Nazis every time. Yeah, and it, you, which is fine. Which is fine, but it's um, the villain's got to be interesting. And yeah, the Iron yeah, Major so, was a cool villain. Yeah, yeah, and the Red Skull was cool. So. Oh yeah, oh, I, he's one of my favorite villains. I love the Red Skull. Can't get enough of that guy. Another bad villain boss. So yeah. Yeah. Hmm. But it's uh, it's interesting. Um, but that's one of the downfalls of war comics. Is, yeah. Is they're yeah. cut and paste villains. Yeah. And um, but I sure I I gotta say though I love reading Sergeant Rock. I love reading the Haunted Tank. Those mm-hmm. doesn't matter if it's a formula or not because it's just good. Good stuff. Because you, li- you like right. Rock and Easy Company. Yeah. You really learn to identify mm-hmm. with the guys in those units. Or you like those characters. Yeah. I was reading some guy. He, he joined the Marines. And uh, and he said, I'd be like Sergeant Rock and throwing tea and tea eggs and shooting a, a machine gun. Bada, 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 and told the drill instructor that. And so, in so many words, that Sergeant Rock is a wimp. <laughs> so he never got to shoot machine guns. But... Um, which is crazy because if you read Sergeant Rock, man, he is not a wimp. He is tough as nails. Well, to Marines, he is. So. Man. <laughs> so, yeah. Oh, well. What's, what do those jarheads know? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so. I don't, yeah, that's cool. I enjoyed that. Um, what did we learn this week, Jeff? Oh. Hmm. What did we learn? Man, Kirby is the king, and he will always be the king. I don't oh, think, yeah. I don't think there's going to be anybody to replace him. Never. Yeah. Never. Kirk, Jack Kirby will always be the king of comics. Yeah, and there's part of because his so much work he's done. Yeah. And and so many characters he made, and his drawing style is so unique. And I don't know the new stuff. I mean, people can do the, the, with the computer stuff. They all looks the same. I don't really notice anybody's different. Styles and all yeah, that. Looks I mean, like, I read current comics and I enjoy them. Um, I don't think that the art itself is computer done. I mean, it's put together with a computer, but it's still done on I in pen it was. and ink. Are no, you it's, sure? It's, yeah, I'm sure. It the, has a different look. I mean, it's very um, the composition of like how you put it together, the color separation, and those things. Okay, maybe just cartoonists. I mean, the you know political cartoonists do that stuff on com- yeah. uh, on computers, but I thought they did it. Um, Get it on computers now. Well, huh. it's somebody still draws it in pen and ink or pencil, mm. okay, and they ink it and whatever, okay. But a lot of that stuff gets to put together on a computer. Uh, I figured that okay. at least. But um, I I don't know. I don't know. I there's some, there's great comics that are gonna be coming out now, but uh, right. it, it, nobody will top Jack Kirby no. ever. Ever, That's ever. Awesome. A bad Jack Kirby is better than most people's best. Yeah. And even, I mean, some of the silliness and the pretentious names and all that stuff, and some of the, you know, um, some of it's kind of hackneyed, but it's, it's still glorious. Yeah. And it's still gorgeous. And, yeah. And inventive, you don't know what's going to happen. So, ooh, that's wonderful. which reminds me, this week, I think, this Wednesday, uh, the latest issue of the Jack Kirby Collector magazine is coming out, and mm. they usually have lots of articles and interviews about him and oh, pieces cool. of his art and stuff. And mm-hmm. I think this issue was a special tribute to uh, his stuff at DC. So, but yeah. Uh, anyway, that's that's about it, don't you think? 
Yeah, I think so. All right, this has been Comic Reflections. Thanks for listening.